What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Love and Rice podcast hosted by Aunt Ma and host Christina Ma. Um, I hope you guys have been enjoying these episodes that we've been releasing, you know, uh, a few times a week, actually. And make sure to follow us on all the podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else that you actually listen to podcast platforms. And I want to hear where you guys do listen to them. So drop them down in the comments down below. And uh, also let us know what topics you guys want to see talk about. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about how important it is to teach our kids the Asian culture. Mm. And as I was growing up, um, a lot of that was ingrained into me. Um, And some of it was by, you know, I had to do lion dance and kung fu since I was like five years old, all the way to college. You know, Um, that was probably one of the biggest things also. You know, my parents are so involved in being in the Chinatown community that I was there literally every week. Yeah, I definitely feel like it's very important um, to teach your children like your culture because it kind of gives them a self like um, it gives them a better idea of like their identity. Yeah. So then they can understand why they were raised a certain way or why there are certain beliefs like within your families. Do you think that being around the community helps that or do they not need to be i think i think they should be around the community yeah because i think for example um me being in chinatown all the time and when i grew up i was in a more of a white dominant uh elementary school and so when i moved from glendale to arcadia Mm -hmm. it was a culture shock for me and i was like wow there's so many asian people and everyone knows about red envelopes and uh, chicken feed and all these things. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't just the weird one in elementary school. And so uh, being around the Asian community, I feel like it's definitely helped me grow because I see the difference between me and my brothers who grew up in Glendale their whole life. Okay. Right. And so I'm the one that makes all this Chinese food. They make more Americanized food. Right. Right. So it's just simple things like that. And like now I can pass on the traditions to my kids or our kids uh, about, you know, Chinese food, comfort foods, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And I I just feel like um, growing up, you know, being a being a kid and then becoming a teenager, like you're always trying to find out like who you are. And I feel like just having that sense of um, culture just it's kind of like a safe place for you to be in. Well, growing up in a white elementary school, um, I was picked on a lot. Right. And so. Being in an Asian community, I was not picked on for being Asian. I was just picked on for being small. Oh, (laughs) I I knew that was coming. So, (laughs) you know, no one ever said like, oh, look at this Chinese guy, you know, and they don't do these racist remarks or pull their eyes or anything like that. Um, They're just it's more just like they're just looking at you like, who are you and why do you look different? Kind of. What? in, In elementary school? Yeah. No, they were doing no. I'm oh, sorry. they were doing that. You're talking about when you went to your um, high school, right? With mostly Asian people. Yeah. Okay. It was just more about who's the cooler Asian. Yeah, yeah, and I. F- um, you know, I don't think it matters too much about what school or where you live. I think it's about how the parents teach the kids because you can have the fobbiest kids growing up if you teach them nothing but Asian stuff, right? Even in a white dominant area. Yeah, and I think. Also, just just teaching um, your kids about the culture, like it it helps them to build character and it yeah. kind of helps them to be a better person. So I remember growing up, um, you know, I used to always get picked on all the time for being Chinese. And um, there weren't a lot of Asians in my school as well. So I guess there are two different groups of Asians that were there. So it's either like the Fabi ones that you're yep. talking about that I couldn't really relate to. Yeah. Um, and then there were like the the normal or the cooler ones, which I was around more often. But um, the Fabi ones don't even want to talk to you. Anyways. Yeah. Like they're just in their own circle because they're just speaking their own language and doing their own thing because that's what their parents um, got them accustomed to. You think that they don't trust us? Or just like, look at these spoiled American kids. I have no idea. And I feel like it just all goes back to the way that um, your parents raise you. Yeah. But um, I think it's important to teach them culture and to teach them to be proud of their upbringing. Yeah. Because I've had a lot of um, times where I kind of, um, you know, would compare myself to other people. And uh, I wasn't 
too proud of where I came from. Yeah. But I think as I got older, I started to understand why we did certain things and why we have certain beliefs. And I think the older that I got, I started to be um, more proud of it. What are some ways that your parents taught you, you know, the culture that you think you will show the kids? Um, one thing that my parents always uh, ingrained in me was to always respect your elders. Okay. Yeah. So that kind of ties into, um, you know, just just being respectful towards not just like your grandparents, but your uncles and aunties. And I guess like just your peers who are older than you. Um and just having like better mannerisms and it kind of goes into like Chinese New Year, for example, because you're teaching them to be presentable, to be respectful, but to also like earn the red envelopes and not just to have stuff being given to them. Yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's true. Like you got to work for it, right? You got to say Gong Hei Fa Choi to all the adults. You got to say, you know, Sunny Fai Law mm-hmm. and really wish the elders a happy new year. Like you mean it. Right. Not just be like, Gong Hei Fa Choi, where's my money? Yeah, I remember yeah. I would get in trouble whenever I would do that. I would just go to someone and be like, oh, Gong Hei Fa Choi. Or like, hey, where's my red envelope? And they'd be like, no, that's not how you do it. Right. You know, so just teaching them the principles of things and that um, you have to like follow certain rules or protocols to be yeah. able to be rewarded with something. I think some major key moments that I want to, uh, bring down to the kids is the red envelopes. Yeah. You know, uh, Chinese New Year meals, meaning that we wake up early and we have a full breakfast, like as if it was dinner. Yeah. We have that for breakfast. You know, those are things you don't have normally. And I would love for them to, you know, they're already kind of normalized with that because mm-hmm. we do it now. Yeah. And um, I didn't really get this growing up, but like just uh, reading chinese books with them right now because yeah. your parents always give us a lot of like um abc books right so it's always showing um like chinese words and then translation in english and stuff and i feel like these are the books that the kids keep bringing to me to really? read during the bedtime and um why is that i don't know i feel like they're very like they're like sponges right so right now they're so young they kind of just want to learn everything but the fact that they're so fascinated with wanting to learn chinese words i'm just like that's pretty cool i know they like it i want to understand like for me as a kid yeah i like chinese stuff but not until i got older when i realized it's special yeah you know it's special to get the red envelopes it's special to have these uh chinese comics you know yeah even with like chinese food and stuff too like we just had dim sum right yeah and um the kids you know i just i always like to test their knowledge and i was just asking both of them i was asking Leon, and so one at a time i said hey do you remember what all of these foods are called and i tested all of them and they almost got all of them right like they were just naming every single thing in chinese and then if they didn't know i would teach them how to say it in chinese you know uh teaching leia how to eat chicken feet has expanded her taste for a lot of foods yeah she's now eating the weirdest foods in the world (laughs) more than us right like she's eating fish eyes she's eating little anchovies she likes like Uh, the shrimp head right the shrimp heads Mm -hmm. yeah she likes uh escargots right she likes clams and mussels those are things that i didn't eat at five years old i she they these kids eat really good and it all started with chicken feet exactly you know so um i think that the chinese food really helped her appetite yeah and i feel like when we were growing up and when we were eating these things and things that kind of smelled different yeah like we would be made fun of or we were so or at least speaking from my personal experience like i was embarrassed like if i was eating something that someone didn't know what it was like if i were eating chicken feet i don't think i would have eaten it in front of people because i would feel so um worried about them like judging me and stuff so we might run into this issue in the future right like, right now she has no idea she just thinks it's normal. Yeah. Right. And maybe in about five more years, she might start to feel that. So we have to teach her that it's OK if other people don't like it, but they shouldn't make fun of you for it and you shouldn't feel bad about it. Yeah. And I think that's why it's good that we're starting them so young because they are already proud of it. So if that does happen, they kind of have like a better understanding and you can just touch on that. I think it is going to happen because it's happened to me. You know what okay. I mean? Like I, I ate what. Leia ate when she was young, like chicken feet yeah. and duck feet, right? But when I got to like elementary school in the older years of elementary school, like fifth grade, sixth mm-hmm. grade, that's when I started getting embarrassed. Okay. There's nothing you can do about it. That's when you just start learning like how to be cool. Yeah. 
I also feel though that um, schools are much better when it comes to different cultures now. So there's not so much of a culture shock when different students from different backgrounds come together. Because even at Leia School now, they have parents of like the students from different backgrounds coming into the school and asking them to volunteer, like to bring certain foods that you make at home um, to share with the class and to talk about like Chinese New Year, for example. Yeah. Like we had her teacher ask us if, you know, we wanted to come in to like make a presentation. We were thinking about like giving red envelopes to all of the kids and stuff. Yeah. So I feel like uh, schools are making more of an effort. I think even just every culture and every race is as well. Yes. So like anytime we go eat dim sum, I'll see a white family mm -hmm. or a Mexican family, right? And then we'll go eat some pho and I'll see another Hispanic family eating yeah. pho. You know, and like I see all kinds of life eating pho now. Yeah. You know, so it's more about uh, the families who are open to mm -hmm. the Asian culture and eating our foods that will actually help our kids. Right. Yeah. So I think we, we just have to keep teaching our kids to not, I, I guess to just fully embrace like who you are. That's the trick. It's like, how do we get them to make them feel special and good about it? So when someone says, ew, what are you eating? Or why do you do that? You know, like I want to teach them like, hey, why are you making fun of me? I am Chinese and I like this. This is what I eat. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's maybe a lot more of discipline and pride. And that might come with like martial arts. Yeah. I, I think maybe martial arts. But I think it's just also educating them about things because like going back to the books and teaching them about these foods, this made them want to eat it. Yeah. This made them more familiar with it. And when we have people coming in to eat with us, like from different backgrounds, you know, they'll just be like, oh, you want some of this? Like, do you know what this is? Like they're yeah. actually trying to teach other people what these foods are. So rather than like trying to hide what they're eating, they're actually embracing it and kind of like trying to share the experience with other people. I just thought of this idea. So there's a lot of books that teach kids about the asian culture yeah so you know like the three bears and the goldilocks story right right there's one of the three pandas is it the three pandas three pandas and oh yeah it is the three pandas and goldilocks and so goldilocks. instead of bears it's pandas so like you know she goes and eats everyone's porridge mm -hmm. you know and they make turnip cakes for for the new year yeah and hand out red envelopes which is really cool but what if there were books about someone who's not Asian and saying in the book, what's that, you know, and then trying to maybe make a mm. remark about it. And then the Asian kid says, this is what I do. And then they're like, you know, like you're in the book, the Asian kid is teaching the non-Asian kid. Yeah. I mean, there might be books out there that we just don't know about. If not, but maybe that's we actually write a great one. idea. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of like puts out certain scenarios because these are realistic scenarios that will probably most likely happen. Yeah. So for them to see that and see that example that's set there, like, I think that's right. Gosh. So through the books, they'll, you know, they meant like right now, Leia reads books and she reads them because she memorizes every single word, every picture, and she knows all the books by heart. Right. So if she memorized teaching non-Asians about their culture, like she would be in a very good situation instead of getting picked on in the future. Yeah. And that's a good example, too, for us to actually try to teach them these things, too, before yeah. it happens. I'm definitely going to try my hardest uh, to really ingrain the culture on them. So right now we live in Vegas and there's not much of the Asian culture here like there is in L.A. Right. You don't have lion dance groups. Uh, you don't have like just a lot of things here. I feel like they probably do. We're just probably not around it but i think they they did have like um chinese new year celebrations like in some of the hotels nearby yeah which is great but that's like i want them to be active in it yeah you know? like how you were growing part up. of it yeah. yeah you know i want them to learn how to play those uh those drums and cymbals and things like that so i think that goes back into the way that we raise them because we're not too far from chinatown so if that's the closest thing that we can do you know we would just have to take them out there kind of show them around because i remember when i was a kid too my parents used to take me to chinatown for like everything yeah there are always like little festivals that they would have little celebrations um just going there for like the shopping experience because it's kind yeah. of like a swap meet in a way i don't yeah. know if it's, it's like that out here but, um, you know, just introducing them to all of that. That's um, so last year, there's a Chinese New Year parade in Chinatown, right in L.A. Yeah. And I was like, 
we were living here in Vegas. Mm-hmm. And I was like, we have to go to L.A. and and really experience a parade for them. Yeah. You know, and they and they loved it. They you know? did. They did. And we actually um, left one of our f- close friends' baby showers or birth, uh, their son's birthday just so that we can make it to uh, this Chinese New Year festival. And I know that this was specifically your purpose because you wanted them to be able to like experience what you did growing up. Yeah. And, and I think we should do this every year. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually there. As much as they didn't want to leave the party, they had so much more fun out there. Yeah. And they just like really enjoyed it more than I expected them to at their age. Yeah. They loved it. I mean, they saw the lion dance uh, part of the parade. And then after that, we went shopping at all the the street vendors. They ended up getting little uh, lion dance toys. <laughs> that was so you cute. Know, which is dope. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they're always going to have that toy in the room and, you know, it's something that they gravitate towards a lot. Yeah. And I think, um, did we also go to like a big, family reunion dinner we did at that time too and i thought that was kind of cool for her to be able to see all of her cousins and your um your family and just being able to like be around everyone from the same culture and sharing those same experiences and then everyone was also going around passing out red envelopes too so i thought that was pretty cool that they actually got to experience this is where it comes hard work for us because we have to upkeep that and be consistent right or else as a child you forget you know, like you can go to Chinese school for 10 years mm-hmm. and then the year you don't go, you're going to forget all your Chinese. Yeah. And I was so good in Chinese school. Like I was going, I was in the same grade with my older brothers and uh, they stayed back and I ended up being like a, in the same grade as them yeah. and they never wanted to progress. And I think, I don't know why um, we stopped going, but I felt like that was one regret that I have growing up because my Chinese is very like it's like broken yeah. like chinglish and that's one thing that i wish that stuck with me and hopefully when the kids are older we can put them in chinese school too so they can keep that language that would be dope i think this is such an important topic not just for like asian americans but i feel like just all different backgrounds because culture is such an important factor like for anyone just growing up and um you know if you guys have any experiences you have any comments that or tips that you want to share with us and with the audience too, drop a comment below because I feel like it's such a, uh, an important thing. Yep. And let us know what is your favorite Asian tradition and that what, what you do with your family. I want to know all that stuff. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about uh, what we want out of our kids or what we expect out of our kids. Uh, Cause being in the Asian community, um, you know, a lot of friends or yeah, a lot of our friends, right. Uh, their parents always said, Hey, uh, I want you to be a lawyer. I want you to be a doctor, you know, and things like that. My parents never said those things to me. Um, they never expected me to be that good of, I, I guess, in school and expect me to get my master's and things like that. So, you know, what do you expect out of our kids? You know, I never this is something that I never really thought about because I think, you know, when we had uh, decided to have our kids, it was more so for um for us because we wanted to see them grow up and to be able to like um give them a good life and spend time with them and like now that we're talking about this i i don't know if i expect anything from them and it could be that maybe because they're so young right now um because i think what i appreciate most is just being able to spend time with them yeah and um well how about when they go to school are you expecting straight a's I don't expect straight A's. I think I'm pretty reasonable when it comes to that. Uh, I just expect them to do decent and to actually like put in the work. I just want to see them try. Yeah, I want to see them try because even growing up, I felt like my parents did put a lot of pressure on us to do good in school. And they, of course, they want a straight A's. Um, They even tried to uh reward us for straight A's so like every A that we got like we would get like a, a quarter for oh, that. Yeah. We actually got paid for those things. Yeah. But even then like back then a quarter wasn't too much. It's enough <laughs> for the ice cream man. Yeah. But I guess I wasn't really motivated by that. I think I was more so of like just wanting to do better in school just because that was something I wanted to do. Like yeah. I I really um 
liked being good in academics. And I would be that kid. Um, I would re- remember being in class. And then you know how um, they would pass out like the sheet of paper. And then they, it would have like math. That was one of my favorite subjects. And then it would have like all um, subtraction problems or all multiplication or addition. And I would always be that kid that's always like racing to try to finish it, like to beat everyone else. And to be the first one that wow. finished it. All right. Yeah. But I think that's something that I just wanted to do. And um, I don't want to put the pressure of like, you need to get straight A's. Like, that's it. Yeah. I think as long as they can pass. But I also, I don't know if I want them to be getting C's either. I mean, I was a C student. Oh. And okay. I tried. Okay. I think it was just that um, I didn't have the ability to pay attention very well Mm -hmm. no matter how hard i tried and so you know i think it's up to the parents to understand does this kid actually have a problem trying to learn or not but i think uh, in the olden days your parents they they don't see any of that stuff right they're just like you're not trying you're not doing good you know but after a while they're just like all right well this dude's a lost cause i think it took them a long time actually because my both of my brothers they didn't um go to college or they didn't graduate or get a degree but um, I feel like the pressure was more always on the girls for some reason. And I think uh, my parents didn't really talk about it too much with my brothers not going to school. But I felt like they were more lenient about it, which is interesting. I feel like because um, the, the, the girl in the family, you, want, you expect them to do better because you don't want them to rely on a boy. Okay. Right? Well, you want them to sense. be independent. Yeah. But for a guy... They can always figure out what to do, you know, Mm. and if they choose to do something hard with their life, then that's that's on them. Right. And they can do it. But with the girl, you don't want to see your daughter go through that. Yeah. You know, and then you don't want to see her rely on a boy. So I think that's why maybe they're harder on the girls in the family. Probably. And I think maybe because I was the oldest girl as well. So there was more pressure for me to actually like go to school and get, you know, my bachelor's degree. Um. Yeah, I I don't know. I think uh, it really just depends on how the kids are as they're getting older. Because I think even for us, uh, you know, with the kids being so young, we notice that Leia's really good in school. She's really yeah. smart. Um, and she she thrives at school. Like she likes the classroom setting. When she does something, she she will not stop until she finishes. Like she's kind of an overachiever. But we've noticed with Enzo that when we try to give him the same type of work i'll try to print out like worksheets like from a workbook or whatever it is for him and then he'll look at it and he's kind of not as interested yeah so i don't know how he's going to be academically and i can kind of already see the difference between the two but i also know that he's he's a very intelligent kid too and he learns really well because of how well he memorizes the planets yeah i mean i don't expect our kids to get straight a's I don't expect them to follow in the Asian standards of being doctors, but maybe uh, the this generation of us where we're raising these, you know, these kids for the first time is like like what I think what I'm trying to say is that we're like first generations. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And we're trying to figure out, do we follow our parents footsteps or are we teaching this new way? And so for us, it's more of like I want them to do the best of what they can but i'm really crossing fingers like if i can take these kids to a really good school where they're meant to invent things yeah or like they have steam classes then i really hope Larry enzo can do that you know yeah. if there can be a, if they can be an innovator or or whatever it is but i just want them to really build something from the ground up on their own and have that sense of fulfillment yeah um i think I probably won't go um, the old fashioned route and expect my kids to, you know, go the conservative route. But like what I did growing up, right, I went to school, um, graduated from high school, straight from high school. You know, I kind of tried to work a little bit, but I also uh, went into college. I applied everywhere and I got into school, got my degree. Um, and then I was in, you know, I got my degree in human resources. I was there for many years, but at the same time, like I went through that, I experienced it, but it wasn't fulfilling enough. And now like, I'm not even putting my degree into use as much as I thought I would be. So what I learned is that all the passions that we had growing up, our parents probably dabbed in it here and there, 
but they never really pushed us right into those passions. You know, if I see a passion from one of our kids, like Leia loves painting mm-hmm. and being an artist and drawing and coloring. Like, I want to put 100% into that for her. Yeah. I mean, I do see that. But I also feel like I want her to try to dip into, like, a lot of other things, too, to see what she can excel in as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we just, we just have to see what her hobbies and her passions are. For yeah. Her to do that. Like, right now, Enzo is actually really liking basketball, you know? And so, if he ends up playing basketball leagues, uh, playing basketball in high school and stuff like that, I know he really loves it. So I would really try and and, and push him towards a basketball uh, field where mm. it's like, do you want to, you know, be uh, what, what is it called um, in sports medicine? You know, you could be uh, you could help tape up LeBron's ankle, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Like I wouldn't move them away from it, you know, but there's so many other things you can do within that passion. Yeah. I, and I think it's good to like expose them to all these different things because, Back then, we were taught that like trying to get into like performance arts or getting into sports was not a lucrative job. So I feel like just kind of letting them expand their minds and kind of like just dip into everything else kind of will help them to figure out like what they're passionate about. I think we've really learned when we just started doing YouTube and we would tell our families that, hey, this is what we're doing. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. And they wouldn't think anything of it or they wouldn't even watch the videos because they had no idea. Um what this world is about and uh now you know eight years later we're doing podcasts yeah and it's like really you can do anything you want if you like it so hey if they chose to do something and that's not even invented yet you know i would i'm all for it yeah you know what i'm just thinking about this but i feel like um because i met you and kind of like your situation with school i think i'm more lenient with like education as well because you know I went the straight route, you know, um, getting my degree and just working like full time in the corporate world after that. But then like meeting you and then kind of hearing like what your struggles were with school, like you're a very smart person, but you just weren't able to um, comprehend school. Yeah. Like academics just wasn't for you in that yeah. sense. And you still went to trade school and you found other ways of, you know, getting your career going and you're still doing that. So if it wasn't for you, I think I would still be like, all right, if I have kids, they have to just graduate high school, get their bachelor's or master's degree, and then just go into the corporate world. Well, here's the difference. So I went through the struggles of really trying to make a life out of what I could Mm -hmm. because I'm only good with my hands. Right. And so that was a very hard route, you know, and it still is. Because right now I have how many different jobs and, yeah. you know, things like that. But I think it's just because you like to, you're a very adventurous person when it comes to different jobs that you like doing that and you like staying busy. I don't think so. It's I think it's because I haven't found that one thing mm. that really makes it for us. I see. And until there's that one thing, I would quit everything else. Okay. That's why I'm kind of dipping my toes everywhere. Are you getting closer with everything that you're doing? Uh, I think we're still trying new things. Like okay. real estate's new. Okay. Right. Do you and, think that could be something for you? It could be if we just keep investing. Yeah. I, I think that's you know that will take us to the next level. Yeah, but who knows? If you don't expect them to, you know, have certain jobs and just do what they want or whatever, like you know, do you do you expect them to have some kind of money or like what do you expect out of that? I think. I just want them to be happy, honestly, as like... <laughs> what, if this, what if Enzo's like minimum wage working at the movie theaters for the rest of his life and he's that guy who's just managing a movie theater and he's happy doing that because he loves movies? I don't know how I would feel about that, honestly. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. saying that he's happy. Yeah. So are you going to be happy for him or like... No, I mean, I would push harder than that because I feel like they would be capable of doing so much more so i don't think i would let them settle in that sense i I think it's more of expanding their mind where it's like what else can you do in the movie world well why don't you try and make a movie with your friends uh here's a camera what are you going to do with the camera you know yeah you want to try some acting do you want to direct do you want to try some um videography stuff there's just so much you can do so it's like if you love just being in that one setting 
you don't know until you try all these other things too that's right. around the same realm. Yeah, so I think it's like kind of taking what they're passionate about and trying to expand their mind even more to it and kind of letting them think outside the box because I want them to be able to, like they don't have to have like the the most lucrative job out there, but yeah. they have to have something where they can take care of themselves because I would want to teach them to not want to live with us at our house until like when they're in their 30s, right? Yeah. And I don't want them to to feel like they can depend on us for the rest of their lives. I just expect them to try. Yes. And so if we expand the horizon, I just want them to keep trying. Yeah. That's all. So in this episode, we're going to talk about how often we should bring our kids back to our hometown. For me, I've been to China twice. And I'm from a very deep village uh, inside, um, I would say, southern China. So when you go to southern China, mm -hmm. there's uh, Canton, right? And inside Canton, there's a place called Toisan. And inside Toisan, there's, uh, there's villages. Uh, pretty much the villages where people eat dogs, right? Yeah. And so I'm from a village, uh, a village like that. And I've been there two times. And it's crazy because it's like hour, hours long drives getting mm. that deep into China. I've never been to China, so I really? can't really relate to it. Yeah. Why? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, my parents just, um they never thought to bring us back there. And I think because they tried to get away from being in China. So I think, um you know, they feel like they have a really good life in the U.S. So why would they want to go back to China to kind of see the poverty and to see, like, the living conditions and kind of, like, relive it again? Well, my parents never thought to bring me. I asked them, when can I go to China? So I was, I think, like maybe 16 years old the first time I went. Yeah. Maybe 14, something like that. And I just went with me and my dad. And um, and you he, initiated the, the conversation. Correct. Okay. And I think, uh, well, because, you know, I've never been to Asia. Yeah. You know, and uh, my bro, and so um, my dad would go every year. Oh, and the reason why okay. he would go every year is because he had a reason to. Right. So... My dad is from China and he was born there, right? And he left when he was like eight years old. Mm -hmm. um, and then he was in Hong Kong, homeless at eight years, eight years old because his father passed away while he was in Hong Kong with him on a business trip. And so up, I, I think he was in Hong Kong for like 10 years. And he then went to Oakland when he was like oh, that's so interesting. in his teens. Um, that's how he met my mom in San Francisco. Why Oakland? I have no idea. Mm. no idea okay um and i never really asked but maybe i should probably i mean that's kind of interesting to go from china and then of all places to be like to go to oakland maybe he yeah. had friends out there if anything or he just happened to like stumble across it but um you know i i think how we connected before was um kind of like with the small villages that our parents both lived in because i feel like my parents, they always talk about these villages that they live in, but because they're so Chinese and, you know, English is not their first language, like with your mom. Um, so then I'll try to ask them certain things. I'm like, do you know what city you were in? Or like, what was this little like town that you're in? But, you know, she would tell me the same things like, oh, you know, we had to eat dogs out there sometimes too. Or like sometimes you would have to eat dog brain or monkey brain and stuff because that's like what you needed to eat to like... Um, to recover from like an injury and she would say all this stuff all the time and i'm like i don't know if i want to see where you guys grew up but she would always say that the, you know there was a lot of poverty out there and that they just had a really hard time living there the poverty is on another level in china so when i did go on like a, a tour with my dad in china we would travel like all the way from south to north and every two to three days we're in a different city and we'll go see all these historic artifacts and places. And when we're on this tour bus and when you're leaving these poor areas, you'll see these like five year old, eight year old kids running after the bus. They got like one arm and they're trying to sell you something, mm. you know, while you're while the bus is taking off. And it's sad. man. I, that's probably one of the reasons why my parents don't want to go back. Yeah, it's really sad. Like I, when I when my dad took me to where he was born and where he lived with his family, it was like um, it looked like a farm, and but they had white, dirty gray concrete, uh, like shacks, mm. and some of the rooms didn't have a roof, 
um, when you go into inside the house, like they don't really have doors and then they don't have beds. And then so when you see these beds, they don't they all they have is like it, it was it looked like it was gray concrete before along the wall yeah. that's made for a bed. And you just see a mattress pad there, like a really thin one, like a futon. Actual mattress. Yeah. And then it's like, it's actually all black now because it's so dirty. Um, They don't have a dinner table. Like, it's like how you see on TV in the poverty, Mm. in in, in like rural areas. Right. You know, it was really bad. So for me to see that as a kid, I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. And then we go in the backyard and there's like, weeds going up to my knees and we're crossing these like going walking along these uh sticks of wood to cross the other side of the mountains and then you see like a whole like area filled with tombstones and it's like it's my grandfather my great grandfather and everyone else that was in the village and they would bury everyone in the back like in the backyard in the backyard yeah that's so crazy so that was my dad's reason of going to china every time was to visit his uh his dad and his grandfather i see you know yeah so i guess seeing that and kind of experiencing that you know we didn't have that growing up that was in our hometown but would you want to take the kids to go to china and to kind of show them i would say yes because one it made me feel special and like realize where i came from yeah and i feel very special that i got to see it because i have like 20 cousins and i don't think any of them have seen it but me would you know how to get your way around there? No, because even the taxi guys don't know how. Oh, wow. You have to ask every taxi person, do you know how to get to this village or this village? And it takes a special guy to know how to mm-hmm. take you there. And so uh, the second thing is because I've seen that poverty, I think this is why I work so hard. You know, oh, that makes sense. Because that's where I came from. And to see how my dad lived like that to where he is now, yeah. I'm like, I can do better, right? I can do more. So why can't I get to this highest level that I can after seeing where my dad came from? Yeah, so it's more of a sense of motivation. right? So I, my dad was in that poverty until he was eight. And then when he went to Hong Kong, he was homeless because yeah. his, his dad passed away. And that's so crazy that he still is like okay with going back home too and kind of like reliving such a... He had a really traumatic life. Yeah. So he was to the point where, like, at eight years old, he was on a park bench, and that's where he would sleep and cover himself with newspapers. And then, you know, he would shiver from the cold and things like that. So it was really bad. I feel like for us as kids, like, that's something that we've never really experienced. Like, maybe if I went out um, and I came home kind of late, like, when it was dark, maybe, like, 7, 8 o'clock p.m., And, you know, like that's late for my parents because I had a curfew. But like if I came home later than I said I was going to, like maybe they wouldn't let me in the house and I would just like be outside, you know, by myself waiting until they allow me to come in again. And like that shivering, shaking feeling. But it's it does not compare to being stranded on a bench, like because that's your only way of survival and not having anyone, you know. Yep. It's very uh, heartbreaking when I hear these stories. Um so do I want to take our kids to China to see all that? I most definitely do. And I don't know how to get there. So we got to go with grandpa. Yeah. So that means we have to go like In the now. next year or two. Yeah. But I don't like, I don't even want to take them right now because one, it's so expensive to travel with kids. Right. Like just for a flight for the kids is ridiculous. Um, and maybe by they get, you know, at this age, when they get older, they're going to forget this. Yeah, that's you true. You know? Yeah. When I was 16 and 18, when I went those two times, I remember everything. Those are more life changing ex- experiences because yeah. I don't remember a lot of things when I was, you know, three or five years old either. Yeah. I-, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to go is because my brothers had an opportunity when they were 14 to travel abroad. And so they spent an entire summer in Taiwan oh, wow. uh, for Chinese school by themselves. Wow. And so, you know, after they got to do that, I was probably just always asking like when can i go to china or Mm -hmm. when can i go to asia so um that that brings me to another question is like would you ever send our kids abroad like that by themselves i don't know yeah because i feel like i always want to know where they are what they're doing and it's more so just because i always want to make sure that they're safe like even when leah's in school i'm just like 
how is she doing? Is she doing okay? Who's watching her? Is she going to the bathroom on her own? Like, there's just so many things. And then when you're, if you're going to send them like abroad somewhere else, like you don't know what's really going on. Yeah. I think maybe because my brothers uh, had each other because they're twins. Uh, but yeah, it's different with Leia and Enzo. She's a girl. Yeah. Uh, how, how old were they when they? 14. Oh, okay. So they're still very young. They, they were like in between middle school to high school. Who was watching them when they uh, were there? I don't know. The school program. Oh, maybe you know the school. okay well not with their school so they were like international students i don't know i don't <laughs> know the specifics i think it was just a school in taiwan oh i see yeah i don't know if i would be okay doing that unless that's something that they like expressed interest in and i knew that someone would be taking care of them and i can trust that person but that that's kind of a yeah i mean even if it was in a trustworthy place uh i don't know if i would I don't know if I would like them to go because now like, yeah, it's great that they're going to learn independence and stuff like that. But then now I don't want them to come back with that independence and leave us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're thinking that's of, so sad. ahead of time. I'm thinking like in the present. What do you mean? Yeah. Cause I'm like worried about them going to school and like that moment of it actually happening, but you're scared of when they're going to come back and what's going to be the end result of that. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking about sending them abroad right now. Yeah. They're five well, years old. I mean, even sending them out of state for school or something like I would still be kind of like hesitant about it, but obviously I would want them to branch out and kind of learn and, you know, still be more independent. Man, <laughs> I'm afraid of everything here that we're talking about. Um, it's a bit scary. It's so. the life of being parents and just having kids. Yeah. There's just way too many things going on right now. Um, in this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, the Asian religions and, uh, you know, having shrines in our homes and things like that. And I know for your family, you guys have a really big shrine in your living room and your parents take it very seriously. Yes. So growing up, um, they used to, they had this huge shrine. It literally like takes up one side of the house, like on the wall. And um, it looks like you're in a temple. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, I think they have it there, you know, because they, they don't go to the temple too often, but they just kind of like do everything there. And um, it's... Most likely because my grandpa, he, I don't know what they call him. I remember we talked about this before, but he used to go around uh, to people's homes and then he would have like his whole posse with him and they would go to these homes that need to get blessed. Like he even did that for our first home. Yeah. And he basically would go around and light some incense. They'll do some chanting and they would drink some water, right? Or whatever it was. And then he, I remember him spitting it around the house all over to, the house yeah. to bless it and then um they also had these like yellow papers where uh it would have some writing on it and it's basically like just this long strip of paper and then they would uh get it and like tape it on every doorway or entryway of the house and all of that was to bless the house um if there are any if there was anything in the house that you know they that we needed to get rid of like it kind of like tells them like oh it's okay leave whatever spirits and bad energy that was in there um i would say those guys are like in between the chinese monk priest pastor type of people yeah there's a term for it but i just can't remember what it is but yeah that's what he um that was his line of work and that's what he did yeah um so i feel like my parents had to have that shrine at home in order for like the holidays uh chinese new year lunar new year the moon like when the new moons would come uh they would always come to our house and they would always like have like we would have all of our family come over. Uh, we would have to have like mooncake. There are certain things that you would have to make certain foods. And these foods you would put in front of the shrine because you're presenting it to the gods or I guess. Yeah, to the gods that you're pretty much um, praying to, whether it's like Buddha, there's a lady Buddha. There's all these different other gods. And I, I don't know. um specifically like if there's certain religions that uh pray to certain like gods but yeah. i know for us uh we pray to like the lady buddha yeah i mean uh our family is more of confucius okay you know um yeah i think we're more of taoist oh i see yeah so you know um are you glad that we don't have that stuff in our house yes because um 
I used to always talk to my parents about it and they said that it, it's a lot of work. So I I believe because my dad is the oldest um, of the family uh, and, you know, my grandpa was the one that was like, he was pretty much a Chinese monk, right? So I felt like he had the duty of having to have that shrine. So it was kind yeah. of something that he had to do automatically. And when I um, would talk to them about it, you know, they say that it it's very stressful because there's so many rules within the house um and you can't do a lot of things because of the shrine yeah like for example um with us right if, even though we're married my parents are always kind of like nervous if we were to stay under the same roof because yeah. i'm the daughter of the house and uh I, I don't know the meaning behind it, but it can bring bad luck if like we're under the same roof in the same bed and they're worried that we're going to do something like be physical in the bedroom. But but the thing is that my brothers, because they carry the Chinese name, they can have their wives come into the home. They can sleep in the same bed and like it's normal, like it's OK. So it's kind of weird. I don't know if they use religion as an excuse for it or if they use it so that, you know, they can keep their daughters from having guys coming over. I don't know. I think every family believes what they want because it's just different in every village. Yeah. You know, but uh, what I do know is that, you know, in our previous houses, we had that red canister. Right. With the holes in it. Mm -hmm. And that's where you burn, you know, money or like fake money and other items. Like clothes, that jewelry. Go to the other world yeah and so i always told my mom because that's the funnest part when you're a kid is just <laughs> burning all that stuff every chinese new year right and so i asked my mom do i need to do that for our house mm -hmm. and so we did it for i think our first two homes right and she was saying that if we do these things and we pray in the house and burn incense in the house we have to be consistent and do it all the time right yes you know? that's what my mom was saying too about so having the shrine either you don't do it or you make it your life. And you have to commit to it yeah. every single day. So here in Vegas, we didn't do it. Uh, but we did like do it at the front door when we first bought the home. Where yes. we lit incense and prayed. And that was it. But we didn't do anything inside the house. Yeah, our our version of incense is kind of like um, other people who use like sage and stuff to clear the house of bad energy. And oh, that's a good way too. to put it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what our culture does. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I even have a scar growing up from like those red tin cans because we're right there because we're um, putting stuff in. And then I remember when I was reaching over to put something in and then one of my cousins like moved it and it oh, touched the, yeah. the red can with when it was like on fire and it bubbled up. So that's something that I will live with forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it gets crazy when you start burning those things. So uh, have you ever been to a Chinese funeral uh, they start burning some really big items. Yeah, like, like cars, yeah, like houses. A, so it'd be like cardboard uh, shaped into a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. Yes. And you burn it and put it in there. And like that tells you that that person is going to have a Rolls Royce or a Bentley in the afterlife. Yeah, and like, there's always a lot of gold and money too, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you're burning food because you just want them to have like abundance when they're living up there. But I think um, like just thinking about all these uh, religions and like traditions that we have, I feel like it's just like it also goes back to like your self-identity and then kind of like having something to fall back into. I would say I felt a little lost for a while because uh, from middle school to high school, um, I actually went the other route. Like my parents had me join a family to go to church, oh. um, a Christian church. I'm surprised. And they, well, probably because one, it was like their babysitter okay. uh, type of thing, right? Like, oh, send our son there and they don't got to watch their son. Right. But like, so I would go to church three times a week. Uh, I would go to summer camps. Uh, I would do basketball league. I was very heavily involved in Christianity. Okay. And to the point where I got a Bible, you know, the priest had to say, uh, or the pastor had to say, you know, do you accept Christ? Yada, 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 mm -hmm. right? And but I never got baptized. Okay. Because I didn't know where I fell in all this. Because one day I'll go to church and the next day I'm burning incense. Yeah. You know? I, I went through the same experience as you because uh my boyfriend at the time, uh his dad was actually a pastor. Yeah. So this was in high school and I was probably I was going to churches. I was going to church every week. I would go to Bible study every Friday attend service uh every sunday and um 
I, I was very much into like Christianity and I was learning all of these things. I even had like my own Bible and everything too. Uh, and I feel like in the beginning, my parents were very concerned about it. I don't think they liked the idea that I'm kind of like going into their house and I have these different beliefs of different gods, right? So I like that my parents, um, they brought me up into Buddhism, but they let me explore different religions and kind of let me um, figure out what I wanted to do. And um, I definitely believe that there's more than one God. Yeah, I believe in both. I, in, I believe in, in all Jesus of them. Jesus yeah. and in all the Chinese gods. Yeah, so I feel like uh, with us, you know, we can um, introduce our kids to Buddhism, burning incense, praying to the shrine like we normally do now. Um, and, you know, just like different customs that we have by taking them to the temples. Yeah. Right? And um, eventually, you know, when they're old enough to make their own decisions, decisions, and eventually, when they're old enough to make their own decisions, too, um, I would let them explore and figure out what they believe in. And I wouldn't just push one religion on them. So what do you call ourselves? Are you more of like atheists? Yes, definitely atheists. But atheists is when you don't believe in any God. No, agnostic. Oh, no, no. Agnostic. We're agnostic. Where we believe in multiple gods? Yes. Yeah. I never hear anybody use that term. Yeah, I guess not. That's why that's why when you said atheist, I was like, yes, that's it. But no, um, I I've, I always uh, categorize myself as agnostic. But that's something that, yeah, we people don't really talk about that at all anymore. Well, I mean, I just look at all the religions and everybody that follows their own gods from all over the world, right? Yeah. And they all believe in something. And if they believe in it, I feel like it's got to be there. So uh, it's like, for sure. You know. Yeah. How can you not believe in all these types of gods? Yeah, because I know there are certain religions where it's a sin, right? You have to only believe in one God and one God only. But I don't feel that way. I'm very open to like a higher power just all around, whether it's in the spiritual world or yeah. through God or through Buddha or whatever it is. So. Yeah, I just I just think uh, <laughs> our the the Asian religion is just the most complicated because they always try to tie in bad luck and good luck with it and superstitions and like it's just weird man yeah well i mean i feel like maybe that's just with every culture but we just don't know about it because that's not our culture and our religion i mean i practiced being a christian for like i don't know pretty close to 10 years oh wow you know and so i never heard of any superstitious stuff mm. just more of like don't do this don't do that um I, I actually think it's a good idea to bring the kids to the temple and see all that stuff you know yeah um i actually really enjoy going there because i feel like um life gets so stressful sometimes and uh that's kind of like our outlet so whenever we are overwhelmed with stuff we like to go to the temple because we feel like everything is so heavy our energy is heavy our spirit is heavy so when we go there we go praying to the gods and we light incense and you know we kind of make our round around the temple and after we leave like i feel so good you know and i feel so light there's there's a lot of uh inspiration and motivation in it compared to the other cultures so like when we go to the temple there's one area that says pray for good health pray for wealth pray for prosperity you know pray for family right and i love those and things. those are all things that are super important to me yeah. they're all things that i value so um yeah i don't like so anytime we go there and we're praying to all these different uh areas uh when i leave i'm like yes now i feel motivated to do better yeah so tying back to that i feel like um it's really important uh, to teach our kids all of these things because it kind of gives them a self, uh, it gives them a feeling of self belonging. So like if they're stressed out or if they are overwhelmed with something and they don't know where to turn, at least they know like, hey, this is what mom and dad does. Like I can just go to the temple, I can pray and you know feel better and know that things are going to be okay. So it gives them like some kind of purpose in life. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's something that we actually do quite often when we go to LA. We just go to you know, different temples and we bring the kids with us. And yeah. I like that. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, drop a comment down below um, on how you guys practice in your family too. And what other topics you want us to talk about. Make sure to follow us on YouTube and Spotify and all other podcast platforms. Thank you for tuning in to Love and Rice Podcast and we'll catch you next time.